Boy, Tales of Childhood, written by Roald Dahl. Landlaff Cathedral School from 1923 to 1925, ages 7 to 9. This is Elise, Roald, and Alfred. A Picnic with Mama. The Bicycle in the Sweet Shop. When I was seven, my mother decided I should leave kindergarten and go to a proper boys' school. By good fortune, there existed a well-known preparatory school for boys about a mile from our house. It was called Landlaff Cathedral School, and it stood right under the shadows of Landlaff Cathedral. Like the cathedral, the school is still there and still flourishing. Here's a picture of Landlaff Cathedral. But here again, I can remember very little about the two years I attended Landlaff Cathedral School. Between the age of seven and nine, only two moments remain clearly in my mind. The first lasted not more than five seconds, but I will never forget it. It was my first term and I was walking home across the village green after school when suddenly one of the senior 12-year-old boys came riding full speed down the road on his bicycle about 20 yards away from me. The road was on a hill and the boy was going down the slope and as he flashed by, he started backpedaling very quickly so that the freewheeling me mechanism of his bike made a loud whirring sound. At the same time, he took his hands off the handlebars and folded them casually across his chest. I stopped dead and stared at him. How wonderful he was. How swift and brave and graceful in his long trousers with bicycle clips around them and his scarlet school cap at a jaunty angle on his head. One day, I told myself, one glorious day, I will have a bike like that and I will wear long trousers with bicycle clips and my school cap will sit jaunty on my head and I will go whizzing down the pet hill, pedaling backwards with no hands on the handlebars. I promise you that if someday had caught me, somebody had caught me by the shoulder at that moment and said to me, what is your greatest wish in life, little boy? What is your absolute ambition? To be a doctor, a fine musician, a painter, a writer, or the Lord Chancellor? I would have answered without hesitation that my only ambition, my hope, my longing was to have a bike like that and go whizzing down the hill with no hands on the handlebars. It would be fabulous. It made me tremble just to think about it. My second and only other memory at Landlaff Cathedral School is extremely bizarre. It happened a little over a year later when I was just nine. By then I had made some friends, and when I walked to school in the mornings, I would start out alone, but would pick up four other boys of my own age along the way. After school was over, the same four boys and I would set out together across the village green and through the village itself, heading for home. On the way to school and on the way back, we were always past the sweets shop. No, we didn't. We never passed it. We always stopped. We lingered outside its rather small window, gazing at the big glass jars full of bull's eyes and old-fashioned humbugs and strawberry bonbons and glacier mints and acid drops and pear drops and lemon drops and all the rest of them. Each of us received six pence a week for pocket money, and whenever there was any money in our pockets, we would all troop in together to buy a penny worth of this or that. My own favorites were sherbet suckers and licorice bootlaces. One of the other boys, whose name was Thewatts, told me I should never eat licorice bootlaces. Thewatts' father, who was a doctor, had said that they were made from rat's blood. The father had given his young son a lecture about licorice bootlaces when he had caught him eating one in bed. Every rat catcher in the county, he, his father had said, takes his rat to the licorice bootlace factory, and the manager pays two pence for each rat. Many a rat catcher has become a millionaire by selling his dead rats to the factory. But how do they turn the rats into licorice? The young Thewats had asked his father. They wait until they've gotten 10,000 rats, the father had answered. Then they dump them all into a huge shiny steel cauldron and boil them up for several hours. Two men stir the bubbling cauldron with long poles, and in the end they have a thick, steaming rat stew. After that, a cruncher is lowered into the cauldron to crunch the bones, and what's left is a pulpy substance called rat mash. Yes, but how do they turn that into licorice bootlaces, Daddy? The young Thewats had asked. And this question, according to Thewats, had caused his father to pause and think for a few minutes before he answered it. At last he had said, The two men who were doing the stirring with the long poles now put on their Wellington boots and climb into the cauldron and shove the hot rat mash out onto a concrete floor. They run a steamroller over it several times to flatten it out. What is left looks rather like a gigantic black pancake. 
And they all have to do after that is wait for it to cool and harden so they can cut it up into strips to make the boot laces. Don't ever eat them, the father had said. If you do, you will get retitis. What is retitis, Daddy? Young Thee Watson asked. All the rats that the rat catchers catch are poisoned with rat poison, the father had said. It's the rat poison that gives you the retitis. Yes, but what happens to you when you catch it, Young Thee Watson had asked. Your teeth become very sharp and pointed, the father had answered, and a short, stumpy tail grows out of your back just above your bottom. There is no cure for retitis. I ought to know. I'm a doctor. We all enjoyed Thiwat's story, and we made him tell it to us many times on our walks to and from school, but it didn't stop any of us except Thiwat's from buying la licorice bootlaces. At two for a penny, they were the best value in the shop. A bootlace, in case you haven't found out, in case you haven't had the pleasure of handling one, is not round. It's like a flat black tape about half an inch wide. You buy it rolled up in a coil, and in those days it used to be so long that when you unrolled it and held one end at arm's length above your head, the other end touched the ground. Sherbert suckers were also to a penny. Each sucker consisted of a yellow cardboard tube filled with sherbet powder, and there was a hollow liquid li licorice straw sticking out of it. Rat's blood again, young Thiwats would warn us, pointing at the liquor straw. You sucked the sherbet up through the straw, and when it was finished, you ate the licorice. They were delicious, those sherbet suckers. The sherbet fizzed in your mouth, and if you knew how to do it, you could make the white froth come out of your nostrils and pretend you were throwing a fit. Gobstoppers, costing a penny each, were enormous hard round balls the size of small tomatoes. One gobstopper would provide about an hour's worth of non-stop sucking fun. And if you took it out of your mouth and inspected it every five minutes or so, you would find it had changed color. There was something funny, something fascinating about the way it went from pink to blue to green to yellow. We used to wonder how in the world a gobstopper factory managed to achieve the ma this magic. How does it happen? We would ask each other. How can they make them keep changing colors? It's your spit that does it, young Thiwats proclaimed. And as the son of a doctor, he considered himself to be an authority on all things that had to do with the body. He could tell us about the scabs and when they were ready to be picked off. He knew why a black eye was blue and why blood was red. It's your spit that makes a gobstopper change color, he kept insisting. When we asked him to elaborate on his theory, he answered, You wouldn't understand it if I told you. Pear drops are exciting because they had a dangerous taste. The, they smelled of nail varnish and they froze the back of your throat. All of us war were warned against eating them, and as a result, we ate them more than ever. Then there was a hard brown lo lozenge called the tonsil tickler. The tonsil tickler tasted and smelled very strongly of chloroform. We had not the slightest doubt that these things were saturated in the dreadest anesthetic, which, as Thiwats had many times pointed out to us, could put you to sleep for hours at a stretch. If my father had to saw off somebody's leg, he said, he pours chloroform onto a pad, and the stiff person sniffs it and goes to sleep, and my father saws his leg off without him even feeling it. But why do they put it into sweets and sell it to us then, we ask him. You might think a question like this would have been baffled, Thiwats, but Thiwats was never baffled. My father says tonsil ticklers were invented for dangerous prisoners in jail, he said. They give them one with each meal and chloroform, and that makes them sleepy and stops them from rioting. Yes, we said, but why sell them to children? It's a plot, Thiwat says, a grown-up plot to keep us quiet. The sweet shop in Lanliff in the year 1923 was the very center of our lives. To us, it was what a bar is to a drunk or a church is to a bishop. Without it, there would have been little to live for. But it had one terrible drawback, this sweet shop. The woman who owned it was a whore. We hated her, and we had good reason for doing so. Her name is Mrs. Pratchett. She was a small, skinny old hag with a mustache on top her upper lip and a mouth as sour as a green gooseberry. She never smiled. She never welcomed us when we went in, and the only time she spoke were when she said things like, I'm watching you, so keep your thieving fingers off them chocolates, or I don't want you in here just looking around. Either you forks out or you gets out, but by the most... By far the most loathsome thing about Mrs. Pratchett was the filth that clung around her. Her apron was gray and greasy. Her blouse had bits of breakfast all over it.
toast crumbs and tea stains and splotches of dried egg yolk. It was her hands, however, that disturbed us most. They were disgusting. They were black with dirt and grime. They looked as though they had been putting lumps of coal on the fire all day long. And do not forget, please, that it was these very hands and fingers that she plunged into the sweet jars when we asked for a pennyworth of treacle, toffee, or wine gums, or nut clusters, or whatever. There were precious few health laws in those days, and nobody, least of all Mrs. Pratchett, ever thought of using a little shovel for getting out the sweets as they do today. The mere sight of her grimy hand, right hand with its black fingernails digging in her an ounce of her chocolate fudge out of the jar would have caused a starving tramp to go f running from the shop. But not us. Sweets were our lifeblood. We would have put up with far worse than that to go get them. So we simply stood and watched in sullen silence while this disgusting old woman stirred around inside the jar with her fo foul fingers. The other thing we hated Mrs. Pratchett for was her meanness. Unless you spent the whole sixpence in one go, she wouldn't give you a bag. Instead, you got your sweets twisted up in a small piece of newspaper which she tore off a pile of daily mirrors laying on the counter so you can well understand that we had it in for mrs pratchett in a big way but we didn't quite know what to do about it many schemes were put forward but none of them was any good none of them that is until suddenly one memorable afternoon we found a dead mouse